Welcome. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be back at DEF CON. It's been a few years. Uh, today we're going to talk about encrypted ads from the 19th century. And my name is Ilanka Dunin. Hello. And uh, my name is Klaus Schmee. I'm a German uh, computer scientist. Uh, I work for a company named Eviden, a European IT security company. I'm also a crypto and crypto history expert. Right. And uh, we have written a couple of books together. Most recently, uh, this one came out in September 2023 from No Starch Press. And if you go down to the east, Vendor Hall, number 29, they may have one copy left. At least that's what we saw when we checked earlier. So, encrypted newspaper ads. Uh, just kind of giving you a, a general idea, uh, this was something that was very popular in the 19th century. Uh, usually they were sent back and forth between lovers. Uh, sometimes they were used for business reasons. And uh, there were a couple of books that were written. This is one from 2006 by Jean Palmer, it was the uh, pseudonym for Tony Gaffney. And he lists about 1,000 of these ads. Many of them have been solved, not all of them. He doesn't provide solutions for all of them. And here's a, a couple more you can see. And uh, the one on the right we thought was interesting because it had uh, an encrypted section at the top and then at the bottom it said, this will be intelligible if read in connection with my communication published in this column on the 8th inst. Inst meant this month. So we went back and we checked. And it gave us no clues. Uh, it does look like it's a transposition cipher, but this one remains unsolved. Uh, here are a couple other interesting ones. This one sort of looks like a Bible code. Also unsolved. And these two clearly related between uh, Tissy and Jabber, also unsolved. And here's a colleague of ours, uh, Didier Mueller. He decided to look in the French newspaper, uh, Le Figaro, and he found thousands of encrypted ads in the French language, at least of the ones he could solve. Uh, we actually met him a few weeks ago in Switzerland, in Porrentuy, and he has this lovely database. Uh, he has found so far, looking at the years from 1875 to 1896, uh, 3,700 uh, cipher messages, only 62% have been broken so far. Here are a couple. And this one was interesting because you can tell uh, if you dig into it, it's a combination of what we call clear text. And then if you look at the numbers in between, it's all five digit numbers. And someone into codes will go, aha, well that looks like a code book code. Um, but we haven't found which code book. We've looked at the code books from that time period. There are some in French and some in English, but um, haven't found anything that works. It's possible that we haven't found the right code book. Uh, it's possible that there's some sort of super encryption going on. So, uh, you know, take a five digit code and you add one to it or divide it by two or something like that. But for whatever reason, we haven't found it. Uh, now this one is a musical mystery. Ce uh, qu'on ne peut se dire, ni s'écrire, on peut le chanter. Do mi, do mi, do re, re fa, re fa, re mi, etc., etc. Vous avez compris? Which in English means that which cannot be said nor written can be sung. And then we put what we think are the, the notes there and have you, have, have you understood? So uh, then we also mapped it to a musical staff here. 
we didn't have any indication of you know what the signature was or or the uh, duration of the note so we just kind of picked something that seemed to fit and if sound works we'll play it for you makes it much more clear. I'm, I'm going to play it once more so you can kind of map it to the do mi, do mi, do re. So there's a couple of things that could be going on here. One is that it could be related to a language called Solresol, which had been invented in France a little earlier by a Frenchman. Uh, it was an artificial language that was based on notes. So I went and I looked for anyone today that might know Sol Rasol. I went on Discord. You can find everything on Discord. So I found a Sol Rasol community, and I asked them if they could read it, if they could understand it, and they said no. And I said, well, if it means anything, it's probably like, I love you, I miss you, why haven't you written to me? And they said no, they still couldn't uh, understand it. Uh, so it's also possible, I, I have some fans that are into uh, classical music, and they said, you know, this sounds like a practice at the beginning of choir what the, the choir, the singers will use to kind of get in shape for the choir. So maybe all this means is see you, seen, see you soon at choir practice. We don't know. There's just a lot, of, uh, a lot of theories on it. So this one still remains officially unsolved. There are many more encrypted ads. Uh, again, most of them are from the late 19th century. Most are broken, some are not. And there's still a lot of research being done on it. Okay, let's now look at a series of encrypted newspaper ads from the 19th century. All of these were published in the Times. There were over 50 of these newspaper ads. Uh, here you see one. It was published uh, in 1853. If we have a closer look, uh, this, this one is the same. Uh, we clearly see that it is encrypted and uh, there's no obvious way to uh, decipher this message, so uh, it's certainly not clear what it means. Let's now go ahead for 130 years to the year 1980. In 1980, the Times, so the same newspaper, uh, published one of these messages again. Uh, apparently, they didn't realize that there was a whole series of these messages uh, so they only found one and they wondered what it meant and so they published it and they challenged their readers to solve it. But there was no success. So apparently none of the Times readers in 1980 was able to break this encryption. Uh, the only thing that was uh, found out is that uh, these numbers and letters that are marked here uh, probably referred to uh, la latitude and longitude and it leads to a place in northern Canada. Well, this is certainly unusual because in the 1850s, not very many people traveled to northern Canada. So uh, this is certainly unusual. And one reader of the Times in 1980 suspected, well, uh, this might have got to do with the Franklin edition. I don't know if you're familiar with the Franklin edition, uh, sorry, with um, a Franklin expedition, but uh, if you're not, Ilonka is going to tell you what it was. Okay. So, the Franklin expedition, this was one of the great mysteries of the late 1800s. So, there was Lord John Franklin, and he started an expedition in 1845. It was a, a British naval ex expedition. He had two ships. They were called the Terror and the Erebus. The reason they had these names is because originally they had been warships. And the theory was is that because they were warships and they were built uh, very, very strongly, that they would be able to be good icebreakers going into the, the ice packs above uh, north of Canada. The goal was to find this Northwest Passage. So instead of going south around South America, was it possible to go north, northwest, and get to Asia that way? So uh, this particular expedition 
Uh, they, they set off from England to, from great fanfare. They stopped off in Greenland to get some supplies and to offload a, a couple of sailors who had fallen ill. And then they headed west across the Baffin Bay and vanished. Nothing was heard from them. No one else saw them. Now, it was a five-year mission, so it wasn't entirely surprising, but a couple of years went by and then Lady Franklin started uh, beating the drum and, hey, where's my husband? And so she was going to the Admiralty and demanding uh, that they set off some uh, uh, search expeditions, find out what had happened to these two ships. So nothing was found from them. And it was actually um, 150 years later that the ships were finally found, right? 150? Yeah. So in 2014 and 2016, uh, the ships were located off of King William Island. The terror was found in the coincidentally named Terror Bay. And then south of it was the Erebus. Now, many books have been written about the Franklin expedition because it was this great mystery of why did they disappear? Was, had aliens come down and got them? Or uh, had they, uh, you know, some sort of sea monster had, had sunk their ships? So basically anyone who wanted could come up with any theory that they wanted. And as I said, there were many different rescue expeditions that were sent. There was this great reward that was offered. This is just a few of the expeditions. Uh, but there were many more. And now let's come back to that classified ad. Did it have anything to do with the Franklin expedition? Was there some relationship between the ad and the Franklin expedition or the ad and one of the rescue expeditions? Yes, so let's now come back to uh, this uh, article in the Times in 1980 when the readers were challenged to break this encrypted advertisement from the 1850s. Well, as I said, no, in 1980 nobody was able to solve this mystery. But 12 years later, this article was published by a British um, encryption expert named John Rapson. He published this article in Cryptologia, which is um, a scientific journal dedicated to crypto history mainly. And in this article, he um, introduced the solution of this mystery. So this is the, the advertisement he looked at. And when he analyzed this advertisement, uh, well, he saw it mainly consists of four letter groups uh, and of some three letter groups. And the letters used here, or the, the lowercase letters, all run from G to Q, excluding the J, which means that there are 10 different lowercase letters used here. There are also a couple of capital letters running from B to F, and in addition, the S was used. And there was also some clear text in this message. Uh, for example, the signature at the end. Um, JDW is clearly not an encryption, it's an abbreviation. Well, uh, if one is familiar with the encryption systems used in the 19th century, it's quite obvious that a code book was used here, or it's at least very likely. Uh, Ilonka has um, introduced a few, or at least one advertisement that was apparently encrypted with a code book. And uh, this is not a new situation for code breakers because many code book encrypted messages uh, were created over the centuries. And the best way to break a code book encrypted message is usually find the code book that was used. Not very surprising, but uh, this method usually uh, very often works quite well because there were not too many code books in use, at least if you know uh, when it when a message was created and who created it, uh, you usually can tell, well, if it was in the military, maybe it was a military code book of the time, or if, if it was some um, uh, business related, maybe it was a business code book. 
Uh, a codebook can be imagined like a dictionary, so for every word of a language there's a, a, a number or may, maybe a sequence of letters and uh, many ciphertexts have been solved by finding the codebook that was used. So the question John Rapson asked himself was, well, is there a codebook or was there a codebook at the time in question that uh, used four letter groups based on the letters from G to Q? And the answer was no, or at least we and uh, John Rapson uh, didn't know of a codebook uh, that matched this requirement. But, well, the letters from G to Q, excluding the J, make exactly 10 letters. So um, maybe the letters were used instead of digits. So maybe uh, the G uh, stands for zero and the, the H for one and so on. And in fact, uh, John Rapson found a codebook that was a very good match it was the so-called Marriott Signal Code. It was introduced in 1817. There were several ed editions and it was uh, quite popular in the 1850s in England. So uh, this looked like a good guess. Uh, if you look into this codebook, you see that it was created for sending a signal or a flag signal messages. Uh, this is not relevant here. Uh, we are not de dealing with the flags, but uh, it could also be used for any other kind of messages as long as such a message could be noted in digits from zero to nine. Uh, here on the right, you see uh, an excerpt from this code book. So as I said, it's like a dictionary and this one replaces every word of the English language with a number between zero, 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 zero and nine, 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 nine. Okay, so what did Rapson do? Well, he took uh, one of the advertisements and replaced every four-digit word, or uh, every letter in a four-digit word with uh, the numbers from zero to nine with the uh, table you can see here, the substitution table you can see here. And uh, then he applied the codebook, the Marriott codebook, and what did he get? Nothing or at least nothing that really looked like meaningful text. So maybe the, uh, the, the mistake was that the re replacement table running from zero to nine was wrong. Mm, was certainly a difficult question, well, what else or we, which other um, table could have been used. So John Rapson looked for crips, for words he could guess in the ciphertext. So uh, here he found one. Here you can see the word IQHL and followed by the word born. So uh, what is born? Of course a child is born, a son is born, a daughter is born. Uh, this required some guessing but uh, one of the hypotheses he tested was, well let's assume that uh, this stands for son and if this is the case, IQHL would be replaced by 8196 and maybe this uh, is the, the correct uh, uh, replacement and if it, if it was the correct replacement this would be how a part of the uh, substitution table looked like. Here's another crypt he found. Here we have the number 3 followed by the word MIOQ. So what could stand after 3? Well just about anything, three days, three weeks, three months, three years. Again, uh, he guessed and tested several hypotheses and one of these was, well, maybe month was uh, the, the correct word used here. And again, he created a part of a substitution table based on this assumption and, well, the two guesses he had made matched. So this looked quite good. So maybe, and uh, in addition, uh, the, the addition, uh, the uh, replacement table you see here uh, looks quite plausible. It starts with a zero, then nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. This uh, looks like a good guess. So again, he tried to decrypt a message. He took uh, this message. He replaced the letters in every four-letter word with uh, the digit according to this table. Then he applied the code from the code book and he got meaningful text. So apparently this was the correct way to decrypt. Yes. Uh, so let's give 
John Rapson, an applause because uh, this was a really great piece of cryptanalysis in, back in 1992. And uh, here we see an example. Mm, and we see, uh, as mentioned, there were not only these four letter groups, but also a couple of uppercase letters. And it now became clear what these uppercase letters mean because uh, the codebook consists of five parts and uh, one of the parts is divided into subdivisions and apparently each letter in uh, each capital letter in the message stands for one of the uh, altogether six parts. And uh, this is exactly how the encryption and the decryption worked. So here we have the E standing for part four and this would be part four in the codebook. Let's now look at the decryption of one of the messages. All are well at Bolden and so on. And as it seems, the, or as we see now, this latitude and longitude appears to make sense. Uh, we, we, we are still not really sure what exactly this means, being accurately seen drifts and so on. But um, at least it's, it's plausible. Here's another plain text. Mm, you see the original in the upper left corner and this translates to or this decrypts to all are well at home and elsewhere. Margaret had another boy in the evening on Christmas Day and so on. Well, uh, this is family goth gossip. Uh, it's a little disappointing uh, because uh, of course other encrypted messages uh, contain uh, the location of a hidden treasure or world politics or uh, important businesses. In this case, it's about family news, but that's also very interesting. But uh, because family news from 19th century, that's not something you encounter every day. Uh, so we tried to uh, de decrypt this message. It wasn't, uh, or it, it was difficult because some of the words are not uh, are ambiguous. For example, popularity could also mean population. That's not, or uh, both uh, words are po possible in the code book. Uh, P and M, that might stand for Papa and Mama, but that's of course also a guess. And uh, this is also a guess because uh, the words used here are coal and rich. So maybe this refers to a person named Coleridge. We don't know, but it makes sense in our view. So decryption is difficult, many ambiguities. Here's another plain text. This is especially interesting because it uh, mentions two names that can be identified, Captain Penny and Captain Austin. And as it turned out, both captains were shipmasters who engaged in Franklin rescue expeditions. So um, we are now back at uh, the Franklin uh, and uh, at Franklin and his rescue ex uh, expeditions. There appears to be a connection. Here's a list of some of the most important Franklin rescue expeditions, which mainly took place or which took place after 1850 when uh, Franklin's wife was calling for help. And if we look at the ads, all of them were published between 1850 and 1855. And this matches exactly with the rescue exp uh, expedition of Richard Collinson. So what was it really Richard Collinson who wrote or received all these encrypted messages? Well, we'll see. Richard Collinson uh, here you see a picture of him and let's now look at the rescue expedition of Richard Collinson. Right. So Richard Collinson set out on a rescue expedition with two ships, one of them being the Enterprise on a five-year mission <laughs> to go and try to find Franklin's expedition. All right. Uh, they did not have any success. What they were trying to do is to come around from England, go around and come in from the western side uh, to see if they could find him from that direction. Uh, no luck. Uh, but there's many books written about his expedition, uh, uh, in part because his brother went through his logbooks and wrote uh, another book 
about Collinson's expedition. And this is one page from that where they talk about cipher notices in the Times that use the signal book of the Royal Navy. And that this advertisement was regularly published. So now we know the mystery or the purpose of the messages was solved. So we call this the first known secure global communication system. His family published encrypted ads in the Times. The Times was available in every major port in the world and he could receive messages from his family during his journey. So did the system work? Well, to our knowledge, only in 1855, on his way home, Collinson got access to the Times in this port in Indonesia called uh, Bango Wangi or Banyu Wangi. And one thing I've learned from my research is there are many ways to spell Banyu Wangi. I have found probably 10 different ways. And in that page from Collinson's journal, there was a mention of Bango Wangi. And I was just at the Royal Museum at Greenwich a couple weeks ago going through the log books of Collinson and found this entry from December 12th, 1854, um, saying that at 2 p.m. he anchored four miles off of Banjo Wangi at the time. So again, we had that link. Here's the only really good picture we've been able to find of Banyu Wangi. This is um, when there was an undersea cable that was being built, and this is from uh, 1871. So when he was in Banyu Wangi, Collinson was able to get four copies of the Times and was able to get some news from home that way. Okay, let's now look at the situation half a year ago at the beginning of 2024. Uh, as I mentioned, the encryption system that was used for these advertisements was broken. But while well, breaking a system and uh, decrypting all the messages is, of course, uh, are of course two different things. In this case, there were 55 messages and not very many of them had been really decrypted. And uh, up to that point, no scholar or no expert of the Franklin edition, uh, expedition sorry, had read the messages. So what we did, Ilonka and I, we started a decryption project. We introduced our concept uh, at the American Cryptogram Association, ACA, and we were joined by Taylor Leach, who is a member of this organization and who um, took part or is, who is now taking part in the project. And there were other members from the ACA supporting us. We had a virtual meeting at an ACA convention in 2023 and a couple of Zoom calls and uh, our goal was to decrypt all the Collinson advertisements and this project is still ongoing. Here's a list of all the messages. Uh, there are over 50. There was one published every month and as you see here, there are gaps. So there were months where no uh, message was published and we don't know why. Uh, maybe there were messages, but we haven't found them. Maybe they were published on the wrong day. Or, or maybe uh, the newspaper didn't publish them for some reason, or uh, there, there was not, nothing placed in the newspaper. We, we simply don't know. Uh, Taylor, he wrote a decryption tool uh, based on JavaScript. And uh, this uh, decryption tool is available online. So if you want to try your luck yourself, here's the URL. So uh, Taylor's decryption tool, it uh, contains a code table taken from the code book. And uh, it includes a section to ignore clear text, uh, which appears in messages or in many messages such as in or at, so frequent words. And we found out, or, or, as already mentioned, Oh, as I already mentioned, these, this decryption work isn't trivial because there are ambiguities, so it's not possible to do everything with a tool. It always requires some manual cleanup afterwards. 
Here we have a list of all the ciphertexts on the left side, all the descriptions of the decryption tool on the right side, and in the middle the cleaned up versions. So um, it's of course a lot of work to do all this description work, but it's very fascinating because, as I said, this is all about a, a family uh, family activities in the 1850s. It's it's a, a, a first hand. Uh, first hand information from what happened in a certain family and uh, well it's it's a it, uh, fascinating look into history one in important question is well who actually published the ads or who wrote these messages uh, it obviously was somebody from the family or maybe a close friend mm, some of the of the ads are signed jdw this is Clearly, Julia de Winton, the sister of Collinson, and some of the messages are signed AC. We are not sure what this means, uh, who, which person uh, signed AC. It might be another sister of Collinson, but we are not sure. Well, Julia de Winton, uh, who created many of these messages, was also a novelist. Uh, in the Victorian era, uh, era so uh, very interesting. Well, honestly, I haven't ever read any of these books, but uh, it's of course interesting to see that a novelist also uh, wrote encrypted messages to her brother being uh, on an expedition in northern Canada or whatever, wherever in the world. So um, while we were doing research at the Maritime Library, we did find several uh, letters. Uh, it, it's a little difficult because th they're not entirely in context. So it'll, there'll be a folder that says uh, Collinson letters and just a big stack of letters. And so we're, we're kind of going through them. And we found that uh, some of these were letters uh, from Collinson's other relatives, like Sophie, Sophia and Amelia. The addresses were often very creative. For example, um, so we have somewhere near the North Pole. Uh, uh, you know, and here was another one that said um, uh, Hong Kong uh, or uh, Arctic Expedition Pacific. And so th they would kind of send it out and hope that it would be passed from ship to ship and hopefully end up with their brother ship. So we know now that there were at least two ways of communication. We had the, the newspaper advertisements from Julia and AC and letters from Amelia and Sophia. And now let's look at the content or at the plain text of uh, the ads. Many of the ads um, mention places, mainly in Great Britain, uh, which is not very surprising. Uh, apparently, Collinson's family, or ma many of the family members, lived in the Newcastle area. So, uh, Newcastle and the surrounding is, uh, are mentioned many times in the messages. But they are all, uh, were also uh, relatives, apparently, in London and Portsmouth, Southampton, and elsewhere. And uh, no surprise is that uh, northern uh, places in northern Canada were mentioned a couple of times because this was actually. Uh, the destination of uh, Franklin's expedition and of course also of Collinson's expedition. And it's also interesting to look at a few events uh, that are mentioned in these ads. Here we have an ad from 1850. Uh, it mentions windows, uh, window is in church. We found out that the family of Collinson or of his uh, sister donated a couple of windows in churches in Wales and this is uh, here you can see pictures of these and this is a drawing we found in uh, the archive so apparently uh, here on the left side we see the small chancel window as it was and on the right side as it is now so after the renovation so and here we have another mentioning of windows, three new windows. Well, we found a drawing of these three new windows in the archive. Uh, in this case, the, the old version is on the right and the new uh, version of the windows is on the left. So this is clearly what this uh, message refers to. Here we read, Queen opening Newcastle station late in August. Well, in fact, in, uh, on August 29th, 1850, 
Queen Victoria opened the train station of Newcastle. And here we read Bernard has been made uh, engineer of the Great Exhibition. This refers to the Great Exhibition at Crystal Palace, which is also known as the World's Fair in 1851. Okay, so this is what we found in the messages and well, let's now, let's now draw a conclusion. All right. So um, we know that Collinson's family sent messages uh, during his journey and it was via encrypted ads, one per month. They also sent letters. We have a project where we are trying to decipher all 50 of these ads and put them in the right uh, context. Uh, hopefully will be done by the end of the year and then we'll be publishing a paper in Cryptologia. Uh, if anyone wants to help, we're always up for more help. Uh, and other than that, um, thank you. We have about seven minutes for questions. So, so uh, yes, uh, the question was why uh, were these messages encrypted? Well, uh, probably to keep uh, these family stories private. That's uh, probably the main reason. So I think uh, these messages contain nothing absolutely secret, but uh, apparently the family members didn't want to read uh, their family gossip in the times where everybody could see it. Uh, another reason is that when you're encrypting something, you can often put more information into it than when it's clear text. For example, uh, with telegrams where people would have to pay by the word. And so there were rapidly code books coming up where you could put a small amount of text to mean a, lot, a much larger phrase. How hard is it to source the code books? How hard is it to? Source the code books. I imagine they don't pop up on eBay very often. Yeah, as a matter of fact, if you look in a hacker tracker, we have some links to the code books. Oh, nice. Yeah. But I mean, like with different code books that you may not have. Like oh, to find other code books? Yeah. It is a constant quest. Uh, and anytime someone finds a new code book, then there's a race to see does this code book help us crack any of the unsolved messages from many sources? Uh, or sometimes we'll try to derive a code book from what we can read. Like if you heard about uh, the Mary Queen of Scots. Uh, story, they derived things from that. I love it. <laughs> so was the use of this type of system, I mean, outside of, you know, military people, maybe, you know, ship captain or uh, military folks, like, you know, lovers, was this really, I mean, did you come across information about people talking about this socially, you know, um, that, that's essentially my question. Well, uh, most of the of the ads were clearly published by lovers. Mm, that there might be more uh, business-related uh, messages, but uh, probably these are the ones that are not broken yet because uh, they used a stronger encryption. So uh, apart from this, well, this story is something special because it's not uh, about lovers communicating with each, each other. Um, did you find anything else that's not really? Well, we know of at least one private detective who would send messages to his clients by putting encrypted ads in the newspaper in London. Uh, and he may have actually been the origin of the Sherlock Holmes story. Was there like discussion of this, you know, socially in the media, you know, contemporaneously in this, you know, 1850s to 1890s, you know, is there yeah. any kind of mention of people? Yes, yes. And uh, especially this was a, a very high status family and we have found many mentions that it was the buzz uh, when people would get together and like, oh, there's these classified ads in the Times and who's making them and why are they making them? And I, I think uh, it did come out that JW was Julia de Winton because that was published somewhere, but the actual system was never published. And there's a, a short story from about that time period where someone is writing about these ads and they made up their own system. 
because they knew no one else could solve it, so why don't they just make up their own system? Uh, and then they wrote a story about it. I'm a longtime fan from the AP days, so. <laughs> Thank you. Do you know how often The Times was published? Was it published daily or, or was it published monthly in the 1850s? was published daily. But I don't know if there were two, uh, if there was an edition on Sunday. There, there might have been a Saturday edition that also covered the Sunday, but apart from that, it was uh, published every day. Yeah. Do, you, do you have an idea of how expensive it would have been to publish an advertisement? Um, we, I'm uh, sorry, I couldn't hear the question. Uh, the question was how expensive it was. Uh, I, I think we have no information how much it costs in England, but in uh, France, uh, we have this information. Well, of course, it's always difficult to say uh, how much um, uh, 10 francs were in, in 1850. But I think uh, compared to the gold price, the, uh, the price for um, an encrypted or for an advertisement was roughly $20 or so yeah. in, in today's worth. It wasn't cheap. Thank you. Hello. Uh, how much has LLMs and OpenAI affected your work in the past three years that you just dump them in there and see what comes out? Uh, s s s sorry? A little closer. Uh, how has LLMs and like OpenAI technology affected your work? In the uh, uh, you mean uh, artificial... <laughs> if, uh, art yes. Artifi artificial intelligence... Uh, yeah, GPT, yeah. Uh, yes, yeah. Or, or in general, um, so far... Artificial intelligence hasn't been used very much in breaking old ciphers, but it's changing. Uh, I, I can imagine that uh, it's very helpful, especially if you have an encrypted text and you, you don't know what it is about. So there are certain algorithms uh, where you can tell, well, this might be an encryption of this kind or of that kind, and it requires some experience. And I'm pretty sure that artificial intelligence uh, can help a lot uh, we are doing this, and I know of research projects uh, that uh, examine this kind of uh, analysis, but so far it, it uh, hasn't been applied very often. But do you know anything else? I, I've done quite a bit with LLMs involving another code, Cryptos, and no, they, they, they can translate from one language to another, but they can't count. Like if you ask for a sentence that's 97 letters long, total fail, total fail, yeah. Did Collins uh, survive? Did Collins survive? Yes. Yeah, well, uh, we know of four he really received. Well, first of all, Collins survived. Uh, but I think it was his last uh, expedition. So as far as I know, the government was not very content with uh, the way he led this uh, expedition. So it was his last one. And I think he retired afterwards. And as far as we know, four of the messages, uh, or he received four of the messages in Banyuwangi. That was probably all. So apparently the system worked, but not very well. I I'm sure he saw the other messages once he got home. Uh, yeah, that, that his sister had them. But, but as Klaus said, um, there was a lot of uh, unrest on the ship, and Collinson was very much blamed for that. And uh, it has nothing to do with codes, but yeah. You mentioned a couple of the other um, family member names. Do you have a reason to believe, or do you have a reason why you think uh, Amelia is not AC? Um, and given the fact that you have other letters and other documents from the family, do you think you're going to be able to look at Yes, uh, Amelia Collinson, uh, or AC might be Amelia Collinson, that's correct, yeah. uh, would be a good uh, the, hypothesis. Uh, they tended to use their married name at that point. Uh, it could well be, but we've, we've just never found any confirmation that it was Amelia. With Julia, we have written confirmation that yes, it was Julia, but it might be. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you.